Um, and uh, I'm especially excited that we have uh, Daniel here today. Uh, and uh, one reason for this is that he's known uh, not in one area of media, but in two areas of media. He's known as a writer and author. Uh, he published his first book, War by Candlelight, in 2006. Uh, he published another novel, Lost City Radio, in 2007. And um, he's been awarded a number of uh, prizes based on this work, uh, including the 2006 Penn Hemingway Award, um, the uh, Guggenheim Fellowship, a Lanon Fellowship. Um, he was named a Best Young American Novelist by uh, Granta Magazine, one of 39, uh, under 39 American novelists. And in 2010, he was recognized by uh, the New Yorker as uh, one of 20 promising writers under 40. Um, so uh, uh, very, very distinguished as a writer. Um, but then uh, in 2011, he went into radio <laughs> and uh, started producing uh, Radio Ambulante, a Spanish language podcast, um, uh, and uh, one that uh, was recently picked up by NPR, I believe, and is uh, distributed by NPR, and uh, is very well known as uh, the host and creator of uh, Radio Ambulante, along with his co-creators, uh, Carolina uh, Guerrero, Martina Castro, and uh, Annie Corleal. Um, I should also mention that in 2013, he found time to uh, write yet another book called um, At Night We Walk in Circles, and uh, he also recently joined the faculty at the Columbia School of Journalism. So uh, uh, I don't know where he has the time and energy, but he, <laughs> he gets it all done. Anyway, please join me in welcoming Daniel. So uh, hi, everybody. Thank you, Manish. That was great. Very kind introduction. Um, my wife always jokes that I went from literature to the other the only other field that is less lucrative, uh, radio, um, and in Spanish, no less. So here we are. Um, but it's, it's really cool to be here. Uh, my wife was a fellow at Stanford at the, at the Knight Fellowship, which is on campus here. And so it's kind of like a sort of a homecoming, although I had like six jobs, so I wasn't here much. Um, but yeah, I'm, I'm really glad to be here and so happy for the invitation. Um, this is going to be a pretty informal conversation, and you can ask questions at any time, or we can hold the questions, you know, however you feel comfortable. Um, basically, I want to talk a little bit about the, the history of Radio Ambulante, how we we started, and then tell you a little bit about what we do and who listens to us, and uh, maybe get into a little bit at the end about why that matters. So I'm going to play you a bunch of clips um, so that you can hear what we do. How, how many of you listen to Radio Ambulante? Oh. Okay, well, I could skip my first, like, six slides then. Uh, but for the, those of you who don't, um, I'm just going to play you just a, a little bit so you understand what we, what we do. Empatado, porque no ver tantos cadáveres, no encontrarse en el río siete, ocho seguidos. Muy berraco. Y en la noche. Bueno, venía llegando a mi casa y vi una gran cantidad de jóvenes vestidos de negro en el medio de la calle, pero no distinguí ninguna cara, ¿no? Punk significa ser un hombre bien responsable de sí mismo. Si tú chupas, mañana trabaja. Entonces la gente subía al cerro y, y él veía a la Virgen y hablaba con ella y él le decía cosas y él las transmitía. Bueno, yo soy, primero soy una persona igual que cualquiera, hace casi tres años que estoy haciendo esto. Entonces siento la necesidad de decir que no estoy loco. No, mi no Michael, o ¿cómo te llamas? Miracol. Dije, ¿eh? Miracol. Nunca pensé que ser director de la biblioteca significaba convertirse en una especie de Sherlock Holmes. Prendimos el informativo a las 6 de la mañana y estaban dando la noticia a la fuga. Y me quedé en medio, en medio de la pista, presidente de Honduras, electo democráticamente por el pueblo, en medio de la pista, en ropa de cama, en Costa Rica. 
Okay, so uh, so how do we start? We we th there's a, there's a backstory to this. And Manish mentioned my first novel, Lost City Radio. Uh, I come from a radio family. My father's first job uh, when he was 14 years old was as a radio announcer calling soccer games in Arequipa, Peru. Um, he was the voice of, uh, of soccer from uh, the uh, Estadio Melgar in Arequipa, which is his hometown. Um, and so he transmitted to me and to my sisters this, this love of radio. When he came to the United States, uh, I was three years old. And the story goes that one time he walked in and heard my, we were, lived in Alabama, uh, and he walked in and heard my sisters speaking English to each other in a southern accent. And, uh, and he was from the provinces of Peru, so understood that accents matter. And uh, so from that day on, we listened to NPR all the time. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way you were supposed to speak. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the other anecdote that I like to tell about radio and the importance of radio in my family was that when we were kids, we would send, uh, we would, we would make little radio stories, like cassettes. My father would interview us, um, like on a Sunday, like, you know, tell your aunts what's going on in school, da da da, da and we would record these cassettes and mail them to our family in Peru. And they would do the same, and, and we had this kind of, I didn't think of them at the time as radio pieces, but now now I think that's pretty much what they were. Um, it was just, you know, had all the intimacy of the human voice. They were like little variety shows. We would sing a song or, or read a poem or something. And um, and that was that was sort of how we... we we communicated with our family back home. Uh, fast forward many, many years. In uh, 2007, I published uh, Lost City Radio, uh, which was also, you know, based on, on a radio program that, uh, that fascinated me at the time. And I got a call from the BBC, and the BBC asked me if I wanted to do a radio documentary. So given this backstory that I have in this love affair uh, that goes back, you know, a couple generations with radio, I, of course, jumped at the chance. And uh, I flew to Lima, and a producer flew from London, we met in Lima and we started uh, working on this piece about uh, Andean migration to the coast. Um, spent about 10 days recording interviews in English and in Spanish. And then the piece went back to London. All the tape went back with the reporter, with the producer. And, uh, and when they sent me the finished mix, it was mostly in English. It was like they cut out all of the Spanish language voices, even though I was doing simultaneous translation most of the time. And naturally, I was a little bit, I was a little bit frustrated. You know, and 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 I, I felt that that something had had been lost. Um, so I asked myself um, this question: So what if there was a space for those voices on the radio waves, and and what would it sound like? You know, that was the 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 the, the primary sort of thing that that I that I began with, and I kept this idea sort of in in my in my head for a long time. This was two thousand eight, um, and. Uh, and it wasn't for, for, for many, many years that I sort of acted upon this idea. And, 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 and it was like that pebble in your shoe that just you know, bothers you and it won't go away. And, um, and, and, and many, many years passed until early 2011 when Carolina, my, my wife, um, and I sort of had this conversation. And we sort of started mapping out, if, it w if we were to create this, what would, it, what, would we, what would be the principles? You know, what would be the idea behind something like this? So it isn't just a question, but it actually might have an answer. So we, we started thinking about this project even before we had recorded a single minute of audio. And we knew certain things were true. We knew that political borders are real, but cultural and linguistic borders are fluid. This totally corresponded to our own experience as Latin Americans, Latinos living in the United States. We uh, live bilingually. We have uh, friends who live the same way. We, have, um, um, uh, we were living here at the time in California, which is essentially part of Mexico to our great um, benefit. Um, and uh, so much so that my Spanish for a long time felt like it was becoming more and more Mexican the longer I lived here. Um, now my Spanish is completely non-specific. Um, uh, so this is one of the things that we believed and we knew to be true. Um, the second thing we knew, and again, this was from personal experience, we knew that the United States has 50 million Spanish speakers, 50 million Latinos, and so it's a Latin American country. Um, and that uh, it probably seems more radical than it is. I don't think that, that in the current climate, I don't interpret it or think of it as radical so much as just an acknowledgement of, of reality, you know? Um, and the last thing we knew, and this also uh, benefited us greatly, was that technology has changed uh, the way we report, produce, and distribute journalism. 
content, I think is what it's called in this area. Um, and uh, and this was this was great for us because we were just starting out. We didn't really uh, know anything, um, but we knew that technology was going to help us out a lot. So um, I want to prove to you how exactly how precarious this was at the beginning. Um, uh, so the, the two hands, these are, these are actual microphones being held by actual people. That's Annie Corral. This was an interview that, that she did in Colombia. But this is really where we started. This is at a, a bake sale that we threw into the farmer's market in Oakland, uh, in Temescal. I don't know if any of you have ever been there. Um, so that's uh, my niece, my nephew, and my son. Uh, we were literally selling cookies to get started because we didn't have anything. You know, We did the, the basic uh, Kickstarter thing. I had never held a microphone ever, um, never written a radio script, had been, like many of you, just a consumer of radio um, who figured that it couldn't be that hard. <laughs> so um, we did the, th the thing that you do, right? You look, get all your contacts and all your emails and you write this really pretty email and you say, hey, we're gonna launch a Kickstarter campaign. We were actually the first um, radio podcast to do a Kickstarter campaign. We sent out this email. Um, and I want to show you this just because, you know, now it's like podcast. Everyone knows what a podcast is. This was, uh, this was the email that I looked back and I found February 3rd, 2012. So that's, you know, it's been a while. Um, and I got this response back, which I want you to see. I don't know if you can read it. So, um, so it was a really pretty email, the one I sent. It was very eloquent. And it was like, you know, I was like, hey, who's not going to be convinced by this? And I got this back from actually someone who worked in public radio. Producing such stories sounds great, but to what end? Then what? Podcasts? <laughs> so uh, I mentioned this only because uh, like, we accept now podcasts as a means of distribution of sound that everyone has in their pocket on their iPhone. But you know, just five years ago, this was so such a crazy idea that a radio producer working in the NPR system on a national show, wrote me an email saying like, what are you gonna do, make a podcast? Like, don't be an idiot. Um, and, and, uh, and again, and I think maybe he was right, and maybe um, if I'd known what he know, knew at the time, like how hard it is to do this, um, then maybe I, we wouldn't have done it. Um, but in any case, we were completely ignorant and uh, therefore fearless, um, and so we got started. Uh, we had the idea, which is obviously where you begin. We spent that first year kind of behind closed doors, creating a team. And uh, and the one thing that I've discovered, uh, as Manish mentioned, I have existed in a, the literary world, and I exist now in the world of journalism and radio. If you take those two tribes of creative people, radio people are so much nicer than novelists. Um, novelists are fairly catty um, people who want to know you know, the, the novel that won that award was a piece of crap. Like, how's that possible? You know, that, you know, that's what they talk about. Radio people are more like, uh, you know, oh, that's a great idea. Have you ever met someone like this? Oh, can I help you with this? You know, and so when we started calling people, we're like, hey, we wanna, we wanna make um, a radio program in Spanish to tell these kinds of stories. You know, people were incredibly helpful, and so it ended up being, you know, everyone was like, oh, I've had that idea, and I know I talked to this person, da 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 da, and it ended up being um, very organic the way we were able to create a team. We made our first stories. We made, uh, one, that's almost like an exaggeration. We actually made a 30 minute audio sampler that went with the Kickstarter. Um, and we spent that whole year sort of learning and practicing and, and um, trying to find a voice, you know, like, and, and you know, more often than not failing. Um, we did the Kickstarter campaign. We raised $46,000, which was a lot at the time. I mean, it, it's, it's not, it doesn't seem like a lot now, but at the time, it was a very, a very significant amount of money with more than 600 backers. And that, that's the part that I, I'm very proud of, 600 backers from more than 20 countries um, with a 30-minute audio sample of like really half-assed stories. Let's be honest. They weren't that great. Um, but it was the idea, and I think it was also the fact that everyone had had this idea. Basically, if you were to speak to any uh, Spanish-speaking or Latino reporter working in the NPR system at the time, you know, hey, you know, have you, have you ever wanted to do like This American Life in Spanish? They all would have said yes, but we were the ones who actually did it. And so everyone was very excited and very supportive and wanted to see it happen more than anything else. Um, so then we launched our pilot season. Um, 
And uh, so now, fast forward to 26, I should update that slide now. Um, we have grown the audience, the annual audience from 7,000 to more than one and a half million. Um, we've produced 75 stories from more than 20 countries. Uh, we've grown the team now. We have are based in New York and I believe there are, you know, I lose count. We just were um, interviewing today for a position we're hiring in Bogota. Um, and we signed the NPR distribution deal uh, last year. So guy that wrote that email, you were wrong. <laughs> um, so, um, but, so that, that's all fine and good, but what is it that we, that we really, you know, like what's the point of all this? You know, um, we wanted to cover Latin America in, in the way that no one else was covering it, you know, covering this region. And a lot of it goes back to those founding principles that I talked about. The idea of a connection between Latin America and the U.S., the idea that there's a cultural fluidity in this entire region. Um, uh, if you go back to the notion of digital, uh, uh, of the way that the digital technology has uh, revolutionized the way we create and distribute, we knew we didn't have to, um, we didn't have to create gigantic audiences in Mexico City. We could create smaller audiences in all the bigger, all the everywhere and aggregate it would be a, it would be a big audience um, and there was no one else doing this this kind of radio uh, or this kind of reporting in sound you know there are we just felt that we were in a position uniquely placed uh, because we were talking about an mp3 that anyone can download anywhere to be a regional outlet a magazine you know and I've worked for magazines like Etiqueta Negra published in Peru uh, and I remember in Etiqueta we were always struggling with uh, people want to read us in Mexico and in Chile and in Argentina, but how do we get the magazines there? And then how do we, you know, or and, and our, our website was 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 trash, so that was a problem. Um, but we just knew that that with this kind of product, with this kind of means of distribution, we could really meet people where they were. You know, and it was only a matter of time that you know smartphone penetration was going to be there, and we were going to we were going to be able to do it. But this was the other question we had: What does Latin America sound like? What well, does Latin America sound? And um, and this was the question that really obsessed us over the the first part of um, of uh, the first few seasons, and uh, and still, and still, you know, we're we we've done stories from more than twenty countries, but there's countries we haven't gotten to, and there's regions of countries we haven't gotten to, and there's types of stories we haven't yet been able to tell. But that's what what makes the work exciting. So our goal from the outset was like we're, we wanted we we want to do something no one else is doing. Now I know why they're not doing it. It's because it's really uh, hard and expensive, um, but at the time it felt so logical. It's like no one's doing this. We have to do it, um, and uh, and we wanted to answer this question. Like if we're trying to create a sound-rich map of Latin American stories, um, and we don't have to do it all at once. We do one episode at a time and put in craft to make sure that, that episode sounds great and tell teaches you something and entertains you. Then then that that's our goal. That's the mission. So. Uh, this is how we do it, essentially. Uh, these are our tools. Um, and, and this goes back to what I said at the beginning. You know, we really could not be a regional project without the digital tools that we have. Um, from the very beginning, we were you know, doing interviews on Skype. We were uh, sharing gigantic files, uh, you know, Pro Tools sessions and later Hindenburg sessions uh, on Dropbox with producers in multiple cities. We were working on Google Docs collaboratively, and all of this I just want to mention for a novelist is anathema. You know, like you, you know, I don't show my drafts to anybody until I'm 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 finished. Um, so for me to learn to work collaboratively was very exciting, uh, anxiety-inducing. Um, but uh, but we we sort of arrived. It was one of those I think moments of um, of serendipity where the idea arrived just at the moment that the technological tools that made that idea viable were coming online, right? So suddenly you could um, have a team that was in, you know, in San Juan, Puerto Rico, in New York, in Oakland, in Bogota, in Santiago, Chile, all on the same call, talking about the same script, while listening to the same audio, you know? And that's something that obviously five years earlier wouldn't have, would have been impossible and even, even fantastical to think about, right? Um, so, so this is the, the beginning. Um, then the, the, the story process is one that we've sort of stumbled upon because, uh, because we, you know, I, 
think basically only one or two people from the team, the original team, had real newsroom experience. I'd done long form journalism. Um, Catalina had worked with with journalists uh, in uh, in managing situations. Uh, had had worked near journalists in other in other sort of like adjacent to journalism. Um, Martina has certainly had experience in a in a in a newsroom. Annie um, has now gone on to work for the New York Times. So there was some experience, but the core, you know, like Camila, who's uh, the senior editor, lives in Bogota. She came from the world of of literature, like me. So we knew more about stories than we knew about production. Um, but we sort of stumbled upon this system, which is uh, again sort of like I think why no one's done this yet. We get a pitch, we evaluate the story, we look into it, we start sort of taking it apart. We assign an editor, which is usually me or Silvia or Camila. We prepare the interview with the reporter. So uh, when the reporter says, I'm going to interview Fulanito, we say, okay. But since we've discovered this the hard way, that a radio interview is not like a radio, not like an interview for, for print. You have to ask differently, you have to worry about different things. And so we don't take the chance anymore that someone goes to do an interview unprepared. We uh, used to just sit and have a have a Skype conversation with the reporter. No, now we actually get on a Google Doc, and everyone on the team who's been pitched, you know, briefed about the story will look at the questions. Everyone knows sort of the broad outlines of the story, and everyone will chip and say, "Okay, well, have you thought about this? You know, I'd like to ask this. You know, if I, I'm interested in this, and we sort of write out our questions, and then the reporter has a, a, a map of the kind of interview that." That they want to do. We use Google Docs. I've later found out now, as a as a uh, with a little more experience, that this is what a normal newsroom does, except they do it around a conference room table. Um, you know, but we sort of were in a situation where we were having to create um, and discover our own workflow because we because we didn't know any better. So then the interview is recorded. The audio is transcribed. We start making an outline with the editor. We start cutting tape, making selects. You know, you. Um, you are writing a script, but the script doesn't exist on paper. The whole script only matters. It only matters what it sounds like. No one's ever going to read your script, right? And so if you don't cut tape and start listening to tape very early on in the process, you're sort of going down the wrong path from, from jump. Uh, so we start writing a first draft. We edit. Second draft, edit. Read the tape. Third draft, edit with a group. Um, and we've done edits where I remember one story in particular a story where the producer was from Tijuana. In the middle of the story, he won a visa lottery and moved to Berlin. Um, and uh, so there was a call where it was, Silvia was in Santiago, Camila was in Bogota, I was in Oakland, he was in Berlin, and we were doing a story about Tijuana. Um, and it was uh, it was just kind of mind-blowing and also very hard to schedule, obviously, for time, <laughs> time reasons. Um, Fourth draft. By this time, if if we don't have it by the fourth draft, then you know let's get out the checkbook and write the kill fee because it's not going to work. Um, tracking. We do a rough mix. Another edit. Usually, there's a last chance to make some more changes. Then I'll usually track the hosts. Sound design. Meaning we do the rough mix has no music, has no sound effects, no ambi. It's just like something we can listen to to get the shape of the story. Then we publish. That in an ideal world takes two to six months. Two is the low end. That's like the fastest I think we've ever done a story is two months. The longest is probably 18 months. Um, How long is the finished piece? A finished Ryan Volante story can be, the shortest it'll be is like 17 or 18 minutes. The longest could be an hour. Um, and that's the, 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 the beautiful thing about podcasts um, is that the story, and this is this is why sort of one of the one of the many reasons why that feel there's overlap with novels, you know, um, no one ever says, or maybe they do, but not as the kind of novels I write. No one ever says like, give me a 200 page novel, give me a 350 page novel. They say, give me a good novel, you know, uh, or maybe even an extraordinary novel. And so then you go and you work hard, and it takes you seven years, and you write a, a, the best novel that you could possibly write. Um, and there's no there's no page count. The novel is as long as it needs to be. A good radio story is as long as it needs to be. A Radio Mulanta story, there's no, there's no limit. You know, if we feel like the story is going to be over an hour and twenty minutes, we'll split it into two episodes. So we just did a series about um, about uh, unaccompanied minors. It was a two-part series. There was one following 
uh, the trajectory through Mexico, um, Central American kids going through Mexico. And another part of the story was at Oakland International High School, where we had a Silvia Vinas, our, our our one of our editors, was in at, at Oakland International High School for a week. And so it wasn't the same kids that we were following, but it was the same kind of story. And that that would split into two weeks. You know. So. Um, one of our, our missions early on was to, to get to make our stories, and we knew that we were, you know, we, we knew that Spanish was very important to us. We wanted to tell these stories in Spanish, but we also wanted to make sure that they arrived in um, in the consciousness of people who didn't speak Spanish. So uh, collaborations for us with uh, media, uh, English language media, was always super important. We've been fortunate to work with some of the the outlets that we have admired for a really long time. Radio Lab, Times Magazine, California Sunday Magazine was published here in San Francisco, uh, BBC Mundo for a while. We've done pieces with This American Life, with Reply All, and now more recently with NPR. So um, those three little letters at the top of our little uh, um, iTunes tile mean a lot to us uh, when we were trying to figure out how we were going to grow to the next step um, uh, and the next phase of this project. The fact that we had the opportunity to, to grow with NPR, which is, uh, for all of its issues, is, uh, you know, rigorous reporting, commitment to quality storytelling, commitment to sound, commitment to to the kind of journalism that we want to do. Uh, we were honored and we are honored to be to be part of the family. Um, and we're also honored that it's we are the first non-English language podcast distributed by NPR. Um and we recognize that that's a that's a risk that NPR didn't really have to take. Um, so so we're we're super proud of that. So I'm going to play you a, a few examples of the kind of the, the kind of stories we do. These are just a few sound clips. They're all translated. Um, uh, this was one of the first stories that we ever produced. I think the first really great um, voice that we found. And uh, and just very briefly, I'll I'll, I'll tell you this guy. I, I was in a boxing gym in LA. I was trying to do a story about something totally different. I was, I was uh, trying to record an interview with this very famous Peruvian boxer, and this guy comes up to me, saw my mic, and you know the guys who come up to you, who see the mic and like their eyes, like those are the ones you definitely want to interview. And he said to me, um, uh, he said, uh, you might find this interesting. And I was like, okay. Uh, and he's like, my brother, may he rest in peace was the first person to cross the United States in a canoe, <laughs> which was like just made kind of no sense to me. And I was like, huh, I was like, okay, tell me more. Uh, he ended up telling me a number of really nutty stories. Uh, the story that was the best, uh, we uh, ended up sending our, our producer, Nancy Lopez, who now works at, at Snap Judgment, uh, sending her down to LA to, to meet with him again. And he told the story of how he arrived in the United States um, in the hold of a ship in 1959 with his best friend, um, Mario. Um, so this is a story, uh, this is another story different from Colombia, it's called uh, Ningun Nombre, NN, No Name. Um, <laughs> NN is our, the names, uh, is the kind of official name for unidentified bodies, and, and this town, Puerto Berrio, has this strange uh, fixation with uh, the bodies that float up and land uh, on the shore. Um, they're often um, people that have been killed in the conflict, tossed into the river, and they float up. And because the town itself has had so many missing from its own from its own population, people have started adopting the bodies um, as kind of um, uh, giving them names, giving them their own last name, people who will look after them, right? And so our reporter Nadia Drost went down, uh, went went to uh, went to Puerto Berrio, uh, spent a couple of weeks there, and came back with this piece trying to understand where this where this um, this unique connection with the, the, the NNs came from. Cuando Julio Marín pesca en el río Magdalena, no es extraño que se encuentre con un cuerpo en el agua, una persona más que ha padecido una muerte violenta. 
La mayoría del hombre siempre va boca abajo. El hombre. Y la mujer siempre va boca arriba. Le pregunto a Julio cuántos cadáveres ha visto. En, el, en ese río. <risas> Asesinado. Póngale poquito, por ahí unos 200. Asesinado. En ese río. De donde encontrar extremidades. ¿De quién será esa mano? ¿Y dónde estará el otro cuerpo? ¿Y quién sería esa persona? ¿Por qué la volvieron así? Uh, so that's a story from Colombia. This, this is a story that I love from, from Argentina. It's called The Superhero. It's about a guy um, who uh, gets it into his head that he needs to fight crime by dressing up as kind of an Argentine version of Captain America. Um, he's the guy in the first clip who said... Uh, I feel the need to say I'm not crazy. Uh, he may or may not be. Okay. Bueno, yo soy primero soy una persona igual que cualquiera y tengo por suerte un poco de tiempo libre. Este es Oscar Natalio Lafose, pero prefiere que le digamos Mengano. Vive en Lanús, una ciudad al sur de la provincia de Buenos Aires y quiere dejar algo muy claro. Siento la necesidad de decir que no estoy loco, no estoy loco. Okay, so I uh, just wanted to keep it, keep it light there, still a story. This is a piece that we did uh, from Juarez with uh, the Mexican novelist Yuri Herrera. Uh, we, uh, we did a Spanish language version, he did an English language version with This American Life. Um, this was about the case, which you may have heard of, a, a woman named Diana the Huntress who was going around um, uh, murdering, um, God, these are so dark. We do stories that aren't this dark, I promise. Uh, Yeah, I gotta fix this deck <laughs> so that I don't bring everyone down. Um, but anyway, the Diana the Huntress was going around murdering bus drivers, and uh, and she ended up sending a letter explaining why. Um, so we sent Yuri very bravely to just ride uh, the bus line in Juarez uh, and interview people and see what what he came back with. El segundo asesinato ocurrió 24 horas después en la misma ruta. Una mujer subió al autobús en el centro de la ciudad y algunas cuadras después pidió la parada. Se enfiló hacia la salida y cuando parecía que buscaba dinero para pagarle, sacó una pistola, le disparó dos veces en la cabeza y huyó. Al día siguiente, un portal de noticias de El Paso, llamado La Polaca, que se especializa en los chismes políticos de Juárez, recibió un correo electrónico. Mis compañeras y yo sufrimos en silencio pero ya no podemos callar más. Fuimos víctimas de violencia sexual por choferes que cubrían el turno de noche en las maquilas, aquí en Juárez. Y aunque mucha gente sabe lo que sufrimos, nadie nos defiende. Por eso yo soy un instrumento que vengará a varias mujeres que al parecer somos débiles para la sociedad. Pero no lo somos, en realidad somos valientes. Y si no nos respetan, nos daremos a respetar por nuestra propia mano. Las mujeres juarenses somos fuertes. El correo estaba firmado por alguien que se hacía llamar Diana, la cazadora de choferes. Uh, and yes, okay, going back to Argentina, this was uh, one of our uh, one of my favorite stories from the from the first season. I think the second season was um, River Plate. Uh, for those of you, it's like it's like the Yankees or something, except in soccer. Uh, and uh, what happened was in 2013 they. Uh, Um, they were relegated to the B, to the B division, the second division of Argentine soccer. This is like as if the Yankees were meant were forced to play in the in the minor leagues or something. Um, and so this was a huge tragedy for Argentine soccer fans um, and a big event in Latin American soccer period, world soccer uh, even I would say, um, because it's one of the most famous teams in, in, in all of in all of South America. And our character uh, who you're going to hear is a guy named. Uh, um, Uh, Atilio Costa Febre, he was the announcer uh, the day they lost, the soccer announcer calling the game on the radio, and he lost his mind. So uh, he stopped calling the game and started cursing out all the, all the owners of the team and uh, on live radio. It was recorded, it went, it, 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 I ended up hearing the tape, someone sent us a link, um, and then we contacted him and we did an interview with him. Apenas siete minutos más tarde, a los 24, el árbitro marcó un penal para arriba. Pavone acomodó la pelota, quería ser el héroe que dejara a River en primera 
pero el arquero Juan Carlos Olave atajó el penal. En una de las cabinas de transmisión del Monumental, Costa Febre explotó. Y en los últimos 20 minutos del partido contra Belgrano, cuando el equipo no podía, cuando el equipo no respondía, cuando tuvo un penal a su favor y Pavone no lo pudo convertir, ahí me di cuenta de la, de la caída y que... Ese ya... momento, el del penal, eh, el, ¿lo recordás? ¿Podés rememorarlo para nosotros? Eh, estaba a punto de cambiar el destino del partido. Un momento doloroso, nunca lo pensé, nunca lo imaginé. Yo me preparé como relator para contar historias lindas de River, para contar campeonatos, para calentarme con malos momentos, pero jamás para hablar de un momento tan triste como este. River estaba empatando uno a uno. Como ¿no? cayó el penal, el penal. El hecho de haber convertido ese penal le daba una chance más de buscar otro gol para quedarse en primera división. Ok, y voy a jugar una vez más. Esa historia es tan divertida. He really loses his mind. He curses. He, he calls everyone rats. Ratas. Um, it's fantastic. Uh, last one I'm going to play. Uh, and I love this the story. It's also from Colombia. It's another story from Colombia. It's about a shaman who was hired. Um, it was later discovered a minor scandal in the in Colombian politics, of which there are many. Um, but a minor scandal was they discovered that during the inauguration of uh, President Juan Manuel Santos, uh, they had spent state money to hire a shaman to make sure it didn't rain. Um, during the outdoor ceremony, um, and uh, then it turned out that he was he was like a shaman that was like used all the time for outdoor events, all the time. We got an interview with him um, uh, when he was sort of trying to to do the same thing. The thing is, like Bogota is the rainiest capital city in Latin America, uh, so it's a really crazy thing to to think that maybe they just shouldn't do so many outdoor events. Um, <laughs> Anyway, so our, our reporter here is Melba Escobar, and, and I think this is the, the, the very end of the piece, but she just writes so beautifully, I wanted to include it. Crecer in Bogotá is acostumbrarse a la lluvia. El clima is variable and impredecible, y en unas pocas horas puede pasar de una tormenta a un sol resplandeciente o a la inversa. No en vano hay quienes dicen que Bogotá sí tiene estaciones, pero las reúne a todas en un solo día. Por eso hay que ir vestido con camiseta liviana, un saco encima luego bufanda, chaqueta y hay quienes llevan guantes y un paraguas, así como las gafas de sol entre el bolso. Sobra decir que en medio de tanta esquizofrenia climática a nadie se le ocurre fijarse en el pronóstico del clima. ¿Para qué? No serviría de nada. Ante la imposibilidad de un pronóstico real, tenemos esto, dudas, un cielo ambiguo, respuestas enigmáticas, oraciones. Fuerza universal espiritual y cósmica, fuente protectora de energía misteriosa, seno fecundo de donde todo nace. Tu logo solar, emanación y mea, vida potente por lo que todo avanza. Ven hacia mí, remedia, defiende, cura mis males, quita mis aflicciones, te lo pido en tu sagrado nombre de aún. Aún, escucha la voz de mi súplica, atiende mi oración. That was hard to translate. En dos años volverá a Bogotá para controlar el clima durante el festival porque hay dos verdades aquí y son absolutamente contradictorias. Jorge Elías González no puede comprobar que él controla la lluvia, como tampoco hay un científico que pueda demostrar lo contrario. Uh, I, I, she's such a good writer. Um, so that's just a bit, sort of a, a, a quick trip through some of the archives of Radio Ambulante. Um, and uh, sort of to, to, to wrap up, I sort of want to tell you who listens to us. We thought, um, we started that our audience would be Latinos and Latin Americans. Um, and we thought that there would be more interest in what we do. I think our initial sense was there would be much more, a bigger part of our audience would be in Latin America. Uh, and, uh, and we sort of discovered uh, that that isn't true, in fact. Um, 60% of, 67% of our audience lives in the United States. Um, and on, on just over a quarter live in Latin America. This was based on our last, um, our last, uh, Um, uh, this is based on, on metrics from our from last season and also from some of our, our audience surveys, which were, were done here with Clara Gonzalez who's in the room. Um, and, and this was the other thing that I thought was very interesting, was that half the, of our U.S. audience isn't, isn't Latino or Latin American. Um, this was a, a huge discovery for us. So basically, we think of our audience as being in three parts. There's Latin Americans living in Latin America. There's Latinos living in the United States. And then there's non-Latinos, non-Latin Americans living in the United States, which are people who just are interested in Latin America, who are learning Spanish, who are students, 
who uh, have married into a family that is Latin American, whatever. Um, and, and this is a big part of our audience that we didn't, we didn't anticipate. Um, this is a number that has people at NPR salivating. Um, so take that to the bank. Um, uh, when we did our last audience survey, um, so two thirds basically responded in Spanish and a third in English. And this sort of bore out the numbers we were seeing on the metrics um, and, and the stuff that people write us. Um, so the last thing I want to mention, because we don't, uh, you know, our primary, our core mission is to tell Latin American stories and to give this kind of audio map of, of what Latin America sounds like. But we do other things. Uh, because we found out those numbers, that third of the audience of people who are not Latin American and not Latino, who live in the United States and who are listening to Radio Volante, uh, we decided to create this project called Radio Volante in the Classroom, where we work directly with teachers um, to help them include Radio Volante in their curriculums if they're teaching the students. So um, we're creating the tools that they need to make sure that Radio Volante is um, both uh, understandable for their students, uh, useful in a pedagogical sense, um, and that they're getting some of the historical context because some of the stories they're not going to understand. Uh, some of the stories are very Latin American um, and that you might need a little bit more history if you're trying to teach you know, a Spanish four class in a, in a college setting. Um, we do live shows. Uh, our, this is photos from our most recent big live show in, in San Francisco at the Buena Center for the Arts. Uh, we're going to do another one there in 2018. We just signed to do that. Um, so I hope to see many of you there. Um, that's another picture from when I had more hair uh, backstage. Uh, and then lastly, this was uh, my wife's project when she was here, and I fell to Escuela de Radio, Escuela de Ambulante, <laughs> which will be launching this month, I believe. We're going to have uh, virtual fellowships with, uh, with Latin American radio producers to take them. We're going to have an application contest. Uh, we're going to select three from Latin America, and we're going to sort of walk them through the pitch process. In addition, we're releasing a series of of uh, teaching videos about um, how to how to interview for radio, how to write for radio, uh, production tips, and that kind of stuff. And we're partnering with Transom.org, uh, which is a great organization that teaches, uh, has a lot of resources on learning how to do radio. And we're translating. We got a grant to translate a lot of their articles by people like Jad Abumrad and Ivor Glass and Nancy Updike and all these amazing radio people um, who've written these great essays that are accessible to English-speaking radio producers or, or novice radio producers, and now they're going to be accessible to Latin American uh, radio producers. So we're super excited about that. And that's going to launch uh, this month or early next month. So yeah, that's my presentation. Uh, and I'm super happy to take questions about anything that you may want to ask. So, thank you. Don't be shy. Yes. I first came across Radio Ambulante when I was looking for something like Golden to learn to, to listen to learn Spanish. Um, and she sent stop. Part reason why you mentioned is like a lot of stories seem to be dark. And, yeah. And, and I don't know why, like, what, like, so is that on purpose or like, or why are you No, that no, I think it's, uh, it's, it's a, it's a, something that we talk about a lot in the team. Um, Sometimes they just, like the pitches that come in are just the pitches that come in and the stories we end up producing and then you know, you're, you're sort of got your head down and you're working so hard um, that it's only when you look up, you know, you have a moment to look up and you're like, wow, the last seven stories have like a high body count. Um, and, and it's, and it's uh, I, I think it has to do with the nature of, um, of being a Spanish speaking, uh, Latino media project in the United States that so much of the stories that are important to our community feel like uh, urgent denunciation, you know, like that there's a need for calling out things that are that are wrong. And I think that's 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 a responsibility that we gladly take on and that we accept. At the same time, we do not at all want Ryan Blanca to be like eating your broccoli. You know, I want the stories to be very entertaining. I love broccoli, so I don't know why I say that. Um, I want the stories to be entertaining, and I want you to, to want to listen to, to the end the same way that when you pick up with my novel, I, I want you to stay up all night reading it because you want to know how, what happens. Um, so it's something we're aware of. It's something that we're trying to change. I think today's story that came out today, you could ask your girlfriend to listen to it. I think it's not 
it's it's tinged with sadness, maybe melancholy, but it's also a very 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 pretty story. Um, I think that um, we're working hard to change that, um, but it has to do with the rhythm and the pace of our workflow. You know, it's not that we're trying to bring you down. I promise. Yeah. What does the name mean? How does it just Ryan Bulante can be translated, I think, sort of like radio on the move. But an ambulante uh, in Latin America is uh, is basically a traveling salesman or someone who pushes a cart. Um, you know, the, the guy who walks around sharpening knives or selling ice cream cones or selling fruit. Um, and so the image of someone pushing a pushing a cart is is what we like. We like we like this image. We went we had a Google Doc uh, that we found the other day that had like 300 names that we were trying out between Carolina, Annie, and I. Um, Ambulante, when we, what we like about it is that basically any any Latin American city, any Latin American town has ambulantes, a little fleet of ambulantes that go around. And also any American city with a, with any sizable immigrant presence has ambulantes, you know. Um, and so we liked it. Also, the ambulante represents, uh, it basically is a startup, you know. And we at the time, and still, operate with the mentality of a, of a startup of, you know, get your hustle on and, and make it work. Otherwise, we wouldn't we wouldn't be here. So, so the image we liked quite a bit. Yeah. Hi, Daniel. Uh, thanks for being here. I'm Brogan. Hey. Yeah. Um, I wonder uh, if you have any insights on why the audience numbers aren't so large in Latin America as you initially expected. Is it just a technology gap or cultural? I think there's a num a number of things. That's a great question. Um, I think that that uh, part of it is is the is is technological. Um, is uh, that data plans are expensive in Latin America. Uh, we've heard from listeners, you know, we did an, uh, this user survey and uh, audience sort of uh, trying to find out who our audience was. And a lot of people said things to us like, you know, students, for example, like they don't take their phone out on the bus on the way to university because you can get robbed. You know, so, you know, it's like, you know, no, you just don't, don't do that. And I know that in, in Lima, like I wouldn't do that either. You know, I wouldn't take my iPhone out on a bus in Lima. Um, so things like that that are that are sort of related to the reality of Latin American cities, I think, is is was one thing. The other thing is, you know, pe people, even people that I know who have smartphones in Lima, uh, many of them don't know what a podcast is. So we've had to do a lot of educating as to what is a podcast. Um, and many people listen to it on their laptops, even though they have smartphones. They've never looked at what the podcast app on the iPhone might be. Or, um, I think all that's going to change. I. I you know, because that's where the United States was 10 years ago. Um, uh, and I think there, here there's an ecosystem of podcasts. So if you're a Latin American and prefer to speak Spanish but love good radio and understand English, you have 10, 20, 30, 100 great podcasts to listen to. But you hear Raúl Mulante and it's the only one in Spanish, so you're like, you're a fan just by default. Um, but in Latin America, there there's no Ira Glass in Latin America. Um, there's no um, there's no This American Life. You know, there's, no, there's nothing like that. And uh, and it, on the airwaves, so there's nothing teaching people that okay. First of all, this is how this also is radio. Like radio in Peru is essentially is like is just people arguing about politics, you know? Or the guy on his cell phone who's like directly from the scene of the fire, you know? He's like, <laughs> you know, like, and, um, and that's a, just has nothing to do with the kind of radio we do. And so people don't, uh, you know, they don't, they don't know that you can do this yet. But we know we're being taught in journalism schools all over Latin America. You know, we did a, a couple of years ago, we did a virtual tour of journalism schools in Latin America where we just set up appointments with classes in 10, 15 different journalism, you know, um, programs. And, and the response from students was amazing. So I do think it's going to change. Um, and I think those numbers, I mean, you know, I want the numbers to grow everywhere. So I don't really, it doesn't matter, it doesn't bother me that the proportion stays that way as long as the, the, the pie gets 10 times bigger. You know? Yes. Um, have you considered doing like three, four, five minute smaller pieces instead of just like big, big, long form things? <sighs> We've considered everything. I think I, that might be the one thing we haven't seriously thought about. Um, I wonder why we haven't thought about that. 
it's uh, it almost feels like because it, because if you're going to invest the time in making a piece of radio, it's so so hard to do that we want something you can sink your teeth into. And our listeners have complained when we have pieces that are you know under fifteen minutes even. So it seems like people want something that feels substantial. And that if, if if we release a new story every every other Tuesday, and that new story is four minutes long, you know we'll definitely get you know people saying things on on social media. So you know you just sort of respond to what people are. Uh, want. Yeah. yeah. Can you walk us through what the relationship with NPR is like about putting those three letters in a little bit? Yes, yes. Uh, essentially, what NPR has done is uh, taken uh, from us the responsibility of having to sell our own ads, and in return, we give them exclusive uh, digital distribution worldwide. They give us a guaranteed income. Right? So, so instead of us having to go to Mailchimp and say, "Hey, Mailchimp, will you, you know, support us?" They do all that for us, and then they just they they give us money up front. So does that mean you have a flat fee from them? There's not a revenue split on the ads. Uh, there is after a certain point. Yeah. And are is like cross promotion and stuff in your agreement with them as well? Yeah, absolutely. I got to hear Terry Gross pronounce Radio Ambulante on <laughs> on the podcast feed. I got to hear she I was at lunch with Jane. I think her pronunciation was better than Peter Sagel's. Uh, um, so yeah, no, all that is very exciting, and it helps. It helps. We see people discovering us all the time. In fact, someone on Twitter today asked uh, if there were any NPR shows in English like Radio Ambulante, <laughs> <laughs> which I thought was pretty great. Um, so that that just that's the kind of thing where it just it's helping right. It's helping NPR too. Ideally, bringing our core listenership. To their shows because I also do cross promotions and you know and I'm like oh esta semana and wait wait don't tell me <laughs> you know that kind of stuff. How do you handle rights for the music that you use to score your shows? Well, we uh, have now the, the NPR music library that's covered by their licenses, and then we have hired uh, uh, composers to, to write music for us. So your agreement with them is you treat it like you're an NPR production. Yes, that means we like that means we can't. Just like sample of Beyonce song, not that we were, but you know we can't anymore. Yes. Um, you talked earlier about uh, how there's sort of certain countries and regions you haven't yet gotten a chance to go to, and certain kinds of stories you haven't yet gotten a chance to tell. Are there particular regions or kinds of stories that you really would love to be able to tell on the podcast and haven't yet? Yeah, I, I mean, I, you know, I think like all Latin Americans, I'm wondering what's going on in Paraguay, like all the time. Um, <laughs> I think. Uh, We've tried three or four times to do stories from Paraguay, and it hasn't worked out. Um, but that's that's a goal of ours. I think uh, Central America hasn't been covered very well. I think by, by us, we've tried. Uh, we're going to keep trying. Uh, we have three stories from Venezuela in the works right now. Uh, Venezuela is a, a, a you know a, a very very significant story and a very very sad story that has to be told. Uh, it has to be told well, and I think that's one of the, that's one of the regions where we can be a great use to the NPR newsroom because we can help them tell stories with on-the-ground reporters that they might not be able to tell. Um, we haven't done enough environmental stories, um, particularly the environmental impacts of, of you know, resource extraction. The fires in southern Chile, for example, is something that we're, we're very interested in. Uh, and we haven't covered enough migration, this is related to Venezuela, obviously, but internal migration in Latin America. Um, uh, which is which is you know there there's there's much more internal movement. Not all the, I think in the United States, but there's the idea that when you talk about migration or immigration, you're talking about people from the south or from somewhere else moving north. And in fact, the movement in Latin America is in every, every which way. And that's the story we want to tell. Lastly, I think we've been thinking about Trump, uh, <laughs> and and one of the things that we that, that is apparent to us very you know now uh, is that. Uh, the Trump Trump rhetoric is, is is changing the way Latin American politicians speak. There's so many over there's so much overlap stylistically between the Calillo style and and um, and, uh, and and Trump. Uh, but in particular, I think that some of the some of the people who are naturally tilt towards that kind of politics and that kind of style uh, are seeing what's effective with Trump, and it's changing the way they're talking. So you have Macri in Argentina. You know, using a lot of the same language against against uh, migrants and you know, immigration, 
in Chile, you're going to see it as we're seeing as well on the right. And I think that's going to, you know, I can certainly see like the Pokemonistas using that language, but I don't know who's emigrating to Peru, so maybe that isn't really an issue yet. So anyway, yeah, I think those are some of the stories, but there's there's more for sure. Yeah. I'm curious if you can recommend a more like a traditional news magazine style program in Spanish. The only one that I found is through the Voice of America. It's problematic in a number of ways, and I'd love to mm. find one that's produced somewhere in Latin America about Latin America. Wow. I don't know. I don't. I, I don't think that I can actually. Um, and it's the same way that when you're when you're writing a novel, you don't have time to read all your peers because you're writing a novel. So, um, but it's a question we get a lot, and and there are definitely more podcasts that people mostly ask us, like, "Hey, what other podcasts like Rather than are there?" And we can recommend or, you know, point people in the direction of, of some new programs and some some you know like, uh, Fuera de Contexto from Mexico, Rato Nacional from Chile is just getting started and. Um, La Raras podcast and you know uh, Argentina podcastera and there's there's stuff in sort of our world but newsy newsy stuff I don't know we're going to start doing uh, quarterly sort of round tables with people in the media about this Trump effect that I was just talking to you about um, but that's going to start probably next month <laughs> but it will be it'll be newsy just not exactly like a, like a weekly news magazine but there must be something yeah one of the things I liked about the show is that you're able to contextualize like larger issues into like deep and personal stories. And I was wondering maybe how do you like go about like selecting what stories you think would be like crucial and like go through pitches and how do you get like that beginning like stage of like choosing a story? We always think first and foremost, like is it is it is it a good story? Does it have characters? Does it have uh, a narrative arc? Um, is this something people are gonna want to listen to? You know? The the this is going to surprise your girlfriend, uh, but really the big themes and the kind of like uh, that stuff comes later. It's always secondary. Um, but I think we have a responsibility in that we're telling stories to a Latin American audience that, uh, you know, it, it, for example, if, if, the, if they're Latinos in the United States, they might understand Spanish very well, but maybe they've never been to the country that their parents are from. Um, maybe they prefer to speak English, right? Um, and then suddenly you're going to hit them with a story from, you know, from El Salvador or from Chile. Maybe they've never heard the accent that, that your story is in or the slang from Peru or the slang from Colombia, right? Um, and the same goes, is true in Latin America, you know, like uh, we did a story from Peru where uh, one of the characters said, uh, creo que me sacó la vuelta, you know, which means I think she cheated on me. But it only means I think she cheated on me in Peru, in in other countries in Mexico doesn't mean anything. It means I think she went around somewhere. Like you know what I mean? It doesn't it's a, it's a, just an idiomatic <laughs> phrase. So we're constantly worrying about how do we make sure that our stories are understood everywhere that people speak Spanish, you know? And uh, without being heavy-handed and without being, um, you know, too um, um, you know pedantic about it, but trying to make sure that our stories have that you have a way of engaging. You know, uh, we are cultural translators as well. You know? But at the end of the day, one of the things that we were told very, very early on when I think was, was getting started, we were told, you know what, this isn't going to work. This was, again, from uh, someone who worked in radio at the time. Um, and they said, you know what, you know, Mexicans only want to hear stories about Mexico, and Puerto Ricans only care about Puerto Rico, and Colombians only care about Colombia. <clears throat> and we knew intuitively that wasn't true. We knew intuitively that a good story is a good story. And, um, and we felt that a good story could, can, can, uh, can overcome those kinds of things and that you know I was looking around when I was going out you know to parties in, in, in Oakland and San Francisco and I would look around the room and I would see you know Latinos from all over all over the world you know I would see Latinos from all over Latin America and I was interested in their stories and they were interested in mine so I was not I didn't think that that was necessarily a valid statement yes oh <laughs> I was hoping no one would ask uh, no, 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 no. I mean, it's a great question. It's a great question. Um, we've tried to do things about Brazil. Uh, we went to Brazil. Carolina and I went to Brazil uh, last year. Uh, we were trying to work on collaborations with a fantastic magazine down there called Piauí. Um, uh, we weren't. We, we we tried to work on a couple stories there and even come up with a with a kind of longer term partnership. 
Now, I think one of the things that we're going to do is uh, try to do stories from Spanish-speaking communities in Brazil uh, or work with Spanish-speaking journalists there who can tell Spanish stories, Spanish language stories. But it's been very hard. It's been very hard. I mean, Brazil really needs its own Ambulante because Brazil is a universe unto itself, you know. And um, and I think they'll get it. Um, you know, I think the OE will, will make it um, happen. And I hope they do. Um, and then when they do, I hope we can collaborate with them. Uh, but it's been very, it's been very hard. Are there any other questions? Yes. I'm just curious about how your emotional proximity or distance to the stories and behavior has been with him in correspondence stories. Can you address the greater societal process of producing these stories <coughs> at all? And kind of just how, yeah, I guess how you've emotionally gone about dealing with the sadness in the stories over the time of reproduction. It's a that's, a, that's a really good question. Um, I think it's, in the same way that like a surgeon, I think, is like cutting someone open and, and is so focused on making the incision correctly that they aren't really thinking about, you know, the person, but they're thinking about the incision. A, a lot of editing, is, it, sounds, it sounds very callous, but a lot of editing, it feels like that, you know? Obviously, when you report a story, Keep in mind, I only report, you know, three or four stories a year, and the rest of the time my role is as editor and sort of like with the team helping guide stories through production. Um, but you know, obviously, when you're cutting tape, you're both really focused on the on the technical process of cutting the tape, but you're also sort of like hearing those words often again and again and again to try to make sure that the that the breaths match and all this kind of stuff. And so it is a very intense process, but. Um, but you know, I write novels, so it's like I, I think about stories all the time, and and I'm able to write a very, you know, you know, a 400 page novel about the war in Peru, and still like live my life and like laugh with my kids and joke and play soccer, and you know, it's like it's it's just a part of my professional training in that you do what you do and you do it the best way you can, and then you turn it off and you go do something else, you know. So I wouldn't say that it affects me emotionally. When it does affect me emotionally is when I go out and report a story. Um, so I reported a story uh, a couple seasons ago about a, a game show and a, and a young woman who died as a result of being part of this game show in Peru. Um, and that story haunted me, I mean, because I spent so much time with the family and was able to get access to the, 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 the TV personalities who were, um, who were, I think, complicit in her death, you know, responsible, morally responsible for her death. Uh, and the fact that I was able to get them on tape and hear them speaking so callously about, you know, someone who, who I felt like I got to know at that point was was hard. Okay. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, thank you. Thank this you. Thank great. you for your question.